Hello and welcome to episode 17 of the Insider's Guide to Project Cars 2 where today we are going to take a look at the next step in our tuning setup guide and that is taking a look at the engine, ECU and gearing tab of the edit setup menu. So we've got the BMW's M6 GT3 stable setup loaded. As per usual, we'll go into the edit tuning setup and we're going to take a look at all the options here on this ECU engine and gearing tab and go through them and basically what you should be doing to get what kind of performance results. So starting off with the first thing at the top is the fuel load and that is basically simply just how much fuel you want in the car. So obviously putting more fuel into the car will allow you to drive for long distances over a longer period of time. Obviously putting less fuel in the car will restrict you to only a few laps. There is a little uh, lap estimation here uh, that goes with basically the fuel uh, that you're putting in so as you change the amount of fuel the lap estimation will also change as well that will become more accurate the more driving that you do in your practice and qualifying session but for uh, qualifying sessions uh, it's generally good to obviously run with less fuel in the car as the car is lighter you have uh, better acceleration so you will reach your potential top speed quicker also the handling of the car will be a little bit more responsive and a little bit more uh, sharper whereas putting more fuel in the car will make the car heavier uh, it will also actually affect the ride height as well It'll make it sit a little bit lower to the ground so obviously as the fuel burns off over the course of a race or a stint uh, obviously keep in mind that the ride height will probably change as the fuel burns off the car will start to move up away from the uh, surface of the track and that will then obviously affect handling and the aero performance of the car so that's something to keep in mind with your fuel load but also with uh, higher fuel loads you can also get a little bit more stability uh, comes with that as well so obviously make sure to do some testing uh, obviously double check how much fuel that you are actually using per lap if you can't do that then use the fuel estimation here as a rough calculator as to how much fuel you actually need for your qualifying session or your race uh, generally what I tend to do is run somewhere between probably about 12 to 18 liters for qualifying that will give me uh, an outlap and then somewhere between the region of two to five maybe six uh, flying laps uh, depending on the actual length of the qualifying session and also actually depending on the length of the track and how much fuel you use on a lap as well so use less fuel in qualifying and obviously make sure you've got enough fuel to actually uh, do the length of the race that you are planning on participating in the next option is boost pressure and this applies to cars that have either a turbo a supercharger or a uh, hybrid curs unit now obviously being in the BMW M6 GT3 we actually have a turbo so we can adjust this here for naturally aspirated cars you will not be able to adjust uh, boost pressure generally what you'll be doing the majority of the time especially in the more modern cars is probably running your boost pressure up at 100% unless you're doing a very long endurance race I'm talking about probably four five maybe six hours plus uh, generally the majority of the time with these newer more modern cars you'll be able to run the boost pressure at 100% more reliably that will give you more power and uh, better acceleration from the turbo however it will use up more fuel and over time it will start to potentially degrade the engine as well in the older cars such as the Lotus 98T uh, a couple of the other older like group C cars and things like that you'll run into engine degradation uh, a lot more and running higher boost pressures will wear down the engine at a much faster rate than the uh, more modern cars that can handle the boost pressure so when running those cars in race trim it can generally be better to turn the boost pressure down a little bit to preserve the longevity of the engine if you're doing qualifying sessions in those it's fine running boost pressure up at 100 percent but obviously if the car's got a big turbo then you need to make sure that you are running a setting that you are happy with the lotus 98t for example has an absolutely massive great big whopping turbo on it and when the turbo actually kicks in uh it can quite frequently 
turn the car into quite a handful as the rear tyres tend to break traction quite easily. If you turn the boost pressure down, then when the turbo actually does spool up and kick in, the uh, the acceleration from the, the turbo produces won't be as large and it'll be much more easier and more manageable to handle. So you probably won't have to fight the car as much. So it's a little bit of a personal preference sort of thing. Uh, obviously with the older cars, turn it down uh, for those longer races that will allow you to preserve the engine a little bit more whereas the more modern cars you can keep it up at 100% no problem and you should be fine and be able to run uh, a good long endurance race running at 100% boost pressure. Now coming on to the air restrictor this is basically pretty much a uh, balance of performance setting in 99.9% .9 cases you don't want to touch the air restrictor you just want to leave it at its maximum setting obviously here in the M6 GT3 that's a value of 55.1 millimeters I can turn it down if I want to uh, that will reduce the uh, overall performance of the engine and it'll decrease the amount of air getting into into the engine and basically it therefore produces less power so what this setting is mainly aimed at and being useful for our communities and leagues who want to run uh, a race and a particular car in say a car class is uh, clearly ahead of all the other cars and they want to and they want to basically impose a a forced air restrictor in order to try and balance the cars within that car class and what they could do is obviously uh, put the air restrictor down and tell all the drivers who are using that car to reduce their air restrictor so the, the performance of the cars across that car class are more equal however obviously the majority of the time when you're in leagues um, or community races depending on the actual car class and obviously just normal uh, single player and online multiplayer uh, in normal lobbies and things like that you'll be wanting the maximum performance that you could possibly get and you'll have the you'll be wanting to put the air restrictor or leave the air restrictor up at its maximum default value there should be no real reason to change it other than basically that balance of performance uh, reason that I explained there so don't real, don't worry about it there's no negative impacts to having the air restrictor up, up at its maximum value so yeah uh, it's not really one that you'll be changing very often if at at all now the next option is the radiator opening and this affects how much air gets into the cooling system of the car now depending on where the radiators are located on the car will affect how much radiator opening values you actually want to be running uh, opening up the radiator opening will allow more air into the cooling system which will help to keep the engine cooler and the water and oil temperatures of the engine uh, will be cooler for that reason but opening up the radiator opening uh, does come with the negative impact of having increased drag so your top line speed will be affected whereas dropping the radiator opening will decrease the amount of drag which will give you better top speed however you will get less engine cooling now generally what you should be aiming for is the oil temperature to be in and around the region of 90 to 105 if it goes above 105 start monitoring your engine temperatures very very closely if it goes above 110 and you've got mechanical failures on then you should pit and get uh, get the car fixed because otherwise if you go above 110 degrees C uh, you kind of run into the range of where there's potential for the engine to blow up and this is before the engine damage actually reaches 100% so the engine can blow up through overheating and obviously running a radiator opening that gets the engine enough cooling will prevent that engine from overheating and potentially blowing up in your race with the shorter sessions you can afford to run uh, with the radiator opening down at a lower value likewise if the uh, general conditions in the track are quite cool you can also run with a lower radiator opening there whereas in hotter conditions you'll need to open up the radiator opening a lot more to prevent the engine from overheating getting above that 110 degrees C threshold and uh, avoiding potentially blowing the engine likewise this comes actually uh, and it helps with uh, managing the engines wear rate so 
as you may be driving around and you've got mechanical uh, failures on, likewise with uh, full damage, you probably see that the engine will start to take damage over time, especially in longer endurance races. Uh, having the radiator opening up higher will help prevent that. And if that uh, engine damage does get up to 100%, that can also lead to engine blo the engine blowing up as well. So it's uh, a little bit of a trade-off with the radiator opening. One tip that I will uh, give with this is obviously if you're doing a, a endurance race, generally what it might be a good idea to do is actually give yourself a little bit of a buffer. So I may have been doing some testing by myself and the conditions allow me to run a radiator opening of say 60% uh, pretty reliably. The engine temperatures are in and around the 95 to 100 degrees uh, C mark. So the engine temperatures are looking good there and I could quite easily run a race with uh, the radiator opening of 60. What I might do though is actually go and bump the radiator opening up to possibly 85, 90% or maybe even 100%. What this will do is, is it will give me a buffer just in case uh, I get into get involved with a slight accident, the car takes a knock, and some of the body working around the radiator opening, or even potentially the radiator itself, actually gets damaged, and that could potentially lead to the temperature starting to increase. Obviously, where I've got that buffer, there's more room, uh, more air going into the engine anyway, and I may not actually have to pit because I have that extra buffer the extra leeway with a larger radiator opening so that if I did take damage it may not actually be enough uh, to make myself concerned with the actual engine, engine temperatures and I may not actually need to pit whereas if I was continuing to run at 60% and I went and took damage I may actually need to monitor the temperatures a lot more closely and that engine temperature may potentially uh, go up above 110 degrees C and I may have to pit. So there's a little bit of strategy in around uh, what radiator opening that you're actually using but those are the kinds of effects that it will have in terms of performance and also uh, engine oil temperature cooling. Now the next option is the engine braking we kind of covered this back in the uh, baseline setup video using a lower value on your engine braking will have a larger engine braking impact so the engine braking will be stronger whereas using a larger value will uh, the engine braking will be weaker and the car will slow down less when off throttle and also off the brake now with higher engine braking values so the engine braking is weaker you get more stability when shifting down into the lower gears Whereas when you have a lower value and you've got more engine braking, when you're shifting down into those lower gears, you may have a little bit less stability, but you also have a kind of almost like a, a trail braking effect going into the corners. So uh, the car will slow down a lot more when off throttle and also off brakes, which help turn in to some of the tighter corners and tuck in more towards the apex. Obviously having a higher value as well, where there's less engine braking, this may actually be useful for some of the more high speed flowing circuits where you come off the throttle and you just coast through a corner with the higher engine uh, braking value and the uh, lesser impact of engine braking going through those turns when off throttle the car will slow down less than coast a little bit more which will help you to maintain that speed uh, going through that corner so there's a little bit of a trade-off generally what I tend to do is uh, go to setting four or five I don't really like uh, going any lower than that because I find uh, that shifting down into second and first gear there's uh, quite a high possibility of me losing the rear end. If you're able to manage that then all the power to you, you can run those lower engine braking values. It will also actually uh, use up more fuel as well uh, using a more aggressive engine braking setting whereas using the higher settings with less engine braking uh, it won't use as much fuel and help you uh, preserve some of that. Also the uh, boost pressure and I believe uh, I think it's just the boost pressure, possibly the air restrictor as well. Uh, they may also have impacts on the amount of fuel that you use on a per lap basis. So a number of these things are kind of tied together when it comes to the actual fuel load. But that is an overview of those engine settings there. Next up we have the gear ratios. Now the final drive option here is basically a all-encompassing uh, gear ratio option.
decreasing the value, unfortunately we can't do it here in the GT3 car, but decreasing the number here will give you a longer gear ratio, which it leans more towards top speed, whereas a increasing or shortening the gear ratio and increasing the number will lean more towards uh, potential acceleration and you'll shift up through the gears quicker. So the final drive is kind of almost like a overall encompassing uh, gear ratio sort of thing and it affects all the gear ratios that are available on the car. Obviously you can see 7th, 8th and 9th gear here. There's a couple of cars in Project Cars 2 that run up to 9th gear. There's also a rev limiter option here as well uh, which we'll come to in just a second. But yeah, uh, obviously the GT3 cars you're usually very heavily restricted to actually being able to adjust uh, the final driving gear ratios. Usually you can't adjust them at all. It's all for balance of performance sort of reasons. But there are other cars in the game that do allow you to adjust the final drive ratio and also the individual gear ratios as well. So running a smaller number will lean more towards top speed and make the gears longer whereas using a higher number will make the gears shorter and lean towards potential acceleration. When it comes to adjusting the individual gears generally first gear is obviously set up for getting off the line then when it comes to adjusting your top uh, the top end gear basically what you want to be doing is getting near to the rev uh, the rev limiter on the longest straight on the track if you can adjust the gear ratios uh, that's what you should be aiming for obviously give yourself a little bit of a buffer for some extra top speed when uh, slipstreaming other drivers because obviously you don't want to set the the gear ratio uh, too short so that when you're driving by yourself you're near enough touching the rev limiter just as you get to the maximum speed at the end of the straight before uh, the longest straight before the braking zone obviously you don't want to then go into the slipstream of another car get that potential extra top speed but they're not actually be able to use it because you're bouncing off the rev limiter uh, basically sat in the draft of the car in front so keep that in mind when setting the highest gear ratio that's what you should be aiming for the rest of the gears in between should be a nice progression up through the rev range basically you don't want a too bigger or too short a gap so that you not shift uh, you're not dropping too far down into the in in the rev range when shifting up into the next gear likewise you don't want to be too high up in the rev range and be out of the torque and power band when shifting up into the next gear uh, also obviously affects uh, when you can downshift as well uh, some cars have downshift uh, prevention so you don't want to have uh, the gear ratio too short that you kind of struggle to shift down into the next next gear because the ECU is telling you that if you do shift down you're going to be too high up in the rev range and bouncing off the limiter and potentially damage the engine or gearbox so that's how you generally want to adjust your gear ratios again the same with the final drive using a lower number is uh, extending the length of the gear which leans more to what's more towards top speed and then shortening it will lean more towards potential acceleration and shortening the gear. Now when you see numbers like this or ratios that are the same as the previous gear what you will find is in this case if I was to shift from fourth gear up into fifth gear where the ratio number is exactly the same when I do actually shift up into fifth gear I'll be in exactly the same I'll be at exactly the same number of revs than when I was shifting up from 4th into 5th gear. So say if I shifted at 6,500 revs uh, when I was in 4th gear up into 5th, when I get into 5th gear I'll be at 6,500 revs. So if that's up at the limiter, you're basically, you're almost taking away a gear. So what you want to do is actually make sure that there is a nice progression of numbers uh, through the gear ratio range and uh, also obviously make sure that it's not uh, too much of a jump to the next gear that you drop down into the uh, too far down into the rev range and kind of fall down to the bottom of the torque and also the uh, power band on the car those kind of things can be found on the telemetry which we covered in the uh, telemetry insider's guide episode so take a look at those and you'll get an understanding of them there you can also actually adjust your gear ratios uh, if you if the fidelity of the gear ratios allow for it. A lot of the very high performance cars such as the high end open wheelers, the LMP prototypes and things like that, they have quite a few increments in terms of gear ratio so you'll be able to adjust those a little bit more uh, finely. But what that will allow you to do is uh, say you go into a gear and it's right on the 
It's right on the brink of using second gear and right on the brink of using third gear. In third gear, sometimes you may drop a little bit too far down the rev range so you don't quite get the acceleration coming out the corner. Likewise, going into it, you may not actually have uh, the, the amount of engine braking that you want to hook into the corner. Whereas second gear will give you that uh, engine braking to hook in, but when you actually get on the throttle coming out the exit, you, you're so high up in the rev range that you're having to shift pretty much uh, automatically, and it feels like you're almost uh, killing the acceleration through there. What you can do is actually adjust the uh, the lower of the two gear ratios that you've been using, so in this case second gear. You could extend it and uh, make the gear a little bit longer, and that will give you a little bit more time uh, accelerating out the exit of the corner before needing to shift up so you can do a little bit of uh, fine tuning gear adjustment there for a per corner sort of basis if you kind of run into that kind of issue and the car actually allows for it generally in GT3 cars though you can't really adjust the gear ratios all that much so you probably won't do much uh, fine tuning of those uh, if at all uh, when using GT3 cars and looking at your gear ratios so coming down the bottom of the here, we've got the final three options. We have the traction control slip is the first one. And what this does is basically allows you to determine how much wheel spin uh, you want to have before the traction control system actually kicks in. Now, the strength of the traction control system is determined by the actual assist setting in the game's option menu. With that, you have the obviously the option of off, where the traction control slip here won't matter. You have the option of uh, having it on low, which will be the weakest traction control setting, and then you have the option of having it on high, and that will be quite a uh, strong traction control setting. And obviously, we'll try and do more work to prevent the wheels from actually spinning up. But when the traction control system actually kicks in, is determined by this traction control setting here. Now, running a lower percentage value will make the traction control system kick in sooner so it will uh, kick in and allow for less wheel spin before the traction control system actually kicks in whereas running a higher value will allow for more wheel spin before the traction control system actually kicks in now running a higher value will potentially allow you to get better acceleration coming out of a corner there may be some instances where you don't want the traction control system to kick in at all you're getting a tiny little bit of wheel spin but you're still getting really good drive obviously having the traction control system kick in at that moment restricts the amount of power uh, going to the rear wheels which could hamper your acceleration coming out of that corner so a lot of the pro drivers what they generally tend to do is if they are running traction control is run a higher traction control slip setting which will allow for a little bit more wheel spin. Generally what I've been finding somewhere in the region of 14 up to 20% works quite nicely for me. Uh, with the default value I find that if I go and dip the wheel onto the curb, obviously the wheels are losing traction on the curbs and spinning up a little bit more and that's then obviously hampering my acceleration coming out of that corner. Whereas if I go and up this up to 14 or 20%, it allows a little bit more wheel spin on those curves and also just generally coming out of corners as well. I get better acceleration coming through that, but also the traction control system still does kick in uh, when I need it. Generally, it's when I actually start to get a little bit sideways and I'm having to actually counter steer and use a little bit more throttle management to actually uh, control the car. That's when the traction control system will actually start to kick in with these higher values. In the wet conditions, it's generally better to run a, a little bit of a lower traction control setting, so probably down somewhere between the region of uh, possibly 18 to 12 percent, just to make it a little bit easier. You don't have to kind of work the throttle as much. Uh, obviously, with uh, controllers and things like that, where you've got less fidel uh, fidelity with the triggers than you would with a uh, set of uh, wheels and pedals, it may generally be better to run a lower traction control settings, but obviously. Uh, tra lower traction control slip setting sorry but obviously bear in mind that you could potentially be hampering the amount of acceleration uh, that you could potentially get coming out of the corner with the traction control system kicking in sooner so that's what the traction control uh, slip setting does the ABS strength uh, setting the strength part is a little bit misleading but again it works in the same way in that it uh, basically determines when the actual ABS assist uh, actually kicks in so running with a higher value uh, will basically make the ABS system actually kick in sooner so uh, it will allow for less wheel locking under braking 
whereas running a lower percentage value will allow for more wheel locking before the ABS system actually kicks in. Now, one thing to bear in mind with ABS is it does not actually reduce your braking distance. Uh, braking distance. If anything, it kind of extends it a little bit uh, more so than your actual, uh, like if you were to do actual proper performance uh, or braking at the performance threshold of the brakes where you would get maximum uh, braking power. So basically all the ABS system does is actually tries to uh, prevent the wheels from uh, locking under heavy braking and allow you to maintain some uh, moderate form of steering control. So upping the value will make the ABS system actually kick in sooner whereas obviously reducing it will make it kick in later. Generally I tend to leave it in and around its uh, default setting. I don't really change it all that much. Uh, as the help text says for loose surface stuff, uh, so like your rally cross racing, it's generally better to decrease the ABS strength as it can actually improve the braking distance as, uh, as the help text describes. What you may find is actually locking the tyres will help the tyres to actually dig into uh, the surface and you'll get more friction through that which will reduce uh, the braking distances there. So there's a couple of things that you can do changing the ABS strength but generally it's something that I don't really tend to adjust all that much but if you want to do, if you do want to change it and adjust it, increasing the value will make the ABS assist kick in sooner whereas decreasing the percentage value here will uh, decrease, uh, will increase uh, the amount of wheel locking under braking that it will allow for before the ABS system kicks in. Both these two options can also be adjusted in the ICM menu uh, when driving out on track and I have done a Insider's Guide episode covering the ICM menu in the past as well so if you haven't seen that make sure to go check out that episode. The last option down at the bottom here is your fuel map and this basically is a bit of a fuel preservation uh, option. Running it at its highest value will consume more fuel but it will give you better acceleration and better straight line speed whereas running a lower value in this case I can only drop it down to 0 0.9 there's only three settings on the BMW M6 GT3 but running it uh, down at a lower value will use less fuel uh, so you, you'll conserve fuel a little bit more on a per lap basis but your acceleration and uh, top speed will be uh, negatively impacted and uh, you won't accelerate as quick out of corners and you probably won't get up to an as higher top speed as you would up at the maximum setting. So it's a little bit of a fuel conservation setting. Generally most people just leave it at this highest setting so they get the maximum performance out of the car and then just adjust the fuel, uh, the actual fuel load and account for how much they're using on a per lap basis and don't really bother about saving fuel and just put in the amount of fuel that they actually need for their race. So that is the last option there and that is all the options covered here on this screen. I'm going to conclude it there for this episode. If you do have any comments or questions feel free to leave those down in the comment section below. I should try and get back to you as soon as possible. Otherwise consider subscribing to the channel if you've been enjoying these episodes likewise i appreciate the likes and the shares and everyone spreading the knowledge that is being uh, shown and shared in these insider guide videos with their friends and other fellow drivers but other than that thank you very much for watching the episode guys hopefully you learned some more stuff on the ecu engine and gearing tab here and hopefully I shall see you in the next episode, but until then, thanks very much for watching, take care.